Deuteronomy 6, 10-12 When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now Moses has been speaking to the Israelites and reminding them about following God's ways and loving God. And he keeps on reminding them that God has promised that they would finally be able to have a place to call their own. And this would be a blessing to them and, and to their future generations, assuming they remain faithful to their side of the covenant relationship with God. Now this land, this isn't just any place. God isn't just giving them a plot of land. Although if he had done that, just given them physical land, that would have been quite a blessing as it is. The Israelites would have had the knowledge and skills to cultivate the land and build whatever they wanted. And yes, it would have taken time and energy and resources to do that. But I think that would have been fine. This was their new home. And they could make it whatever they wanted. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't just give them empty land. Now, Moses is maybe raising their expectations, uh, wetting their appetites concerning the land that God has promised them. Because Moses gives a description of what the land looks like. Let's take a look at these uh, descriptions. It's a land with large flourishing cities you did not build. Now, how long does it take to build a large city? I guess it depends on the size and what structures you want in it. But as the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. Cities would take years of constant planning and digging and building and growing. Cities are always evolving, but to call a city large and flourishing probably would indicate at least several decades of work. For the Israelites, they're going to claim cities that have already been built with the uh, infrastructure to support a large number of people, and this would have saved a lot of time on their part. Sure, they'd have to clean it up a bit and work out some logistic issues, but that's nothing compared to what they would be inheriting in these already existing and flourishing cities. What else? Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. These are houses that have already been built. Not only that, it seems like the houses would be filled with good things. Now, I don't know what kind of good things they would have. Maybe nice possessions of the previous owners, or perhaps just that the homes would be fully furnished. You know, it's, it's, it's such a, a great help if you're starting out and you don't have a lot to make your home inviting and welcoming. In the early days... Uh, in our early days in the UK, my wife and I were looking for a two-bedroom flat to rent, and we discussed whether we wanted some something furnished or unfurnished, and we ended up going with something furnished because we didn't want to have to buy large furniture yet if we were uh, going to be moving again anyway. But it was such a huge blessing to have a furnished place. Now, I don't know if it's the standard in this country, but I remember being surprised that the landlord even provided bed linen and towels and soap and toilet paper and a bunch of other amenities and the only thing we needed to buy at least at least at the start was food and you know they even gave us a couple glass dishes as a parting gift to remember the flat when we left all kinds of good things and wells you did not dig there would already be wells dug. There's no need to do the hard work of finding water. That would, that would be done already. Now this might seem a bit strange in our day where water is already connected to our homes and freely flows from our taps, but in those days, you had to find a source of water in order to sustain life. Remember, the Israelites have been wandering in the wilderness. 
So far, they've only gotten water when their wandering led them to some water source and from a, a rock which Moses struck. But having a constant source of water from a well was a luxury for them. Water would be provided, which means life would be sustained. And furthermore, they would have vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. So not only do they have a source of water for their basic needs, but they would have vineyards and olive groves. Now these were luxuries, and, and, and they took time to cultivate. Vineyards probably took about four years before you can actually harvest its fruit to make wine. And olive groves around five years from planting before you start seeing any olives. Now that's, this is assuming everything goes smoothly and nothing happens to your crops. So to move in and be able to use an existing vineyard and olive grove means that they can start producing and trading goods relatively quickly. So these were blessings of the land that God was providing for the people. Now Moses elaborates a bit more about this promised land later on in chapter, uh, chapter 8. And he says this, he says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where rocks and iron, where the rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. Now this, this sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Do you see how big a deal this was for the Israelites? They are going from being homeless and wanderers to suddenly, and, and, and not only having their own place, but a place that would normally take years to build and accumulate and develop. They'll have food and water and resources. Now, if you want to look at it a different way, it's, it's like they've just won, uh, won the lottery. But unlike the lottery, it's, it's not by chance. We, we know who's behind all this wealth. This is God's blessing on them as his covenant partners. God blesses them by giving all they need to flourish, to thrive, to, to have and create wealth, to drink and not thirst, to eat and be satisfied. However, however, this comes with a warning and this comes in stark contrast to all this wonderful description of the promised land. Moses warns them, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Be careful you don't forget the Lord. Now remember, the, the, the Israelites were being warned of idolatry in Canaan. So forgetting God, we can say, is part of the nature of idolatry. And there's a link here between having wealth and forgetting the Lord. Now even though we're, remi uh, we're reminded that their wealth would be a blessing from God, there still is a danger of forgetting God. A danger of a sort of spiritual amnesia. So what are the signs of forgetting? Now, we need to move a couple chapters forward to chapter 8 to get a better picture of this. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I'll highlight a few uh, of the relevant verses. So, what are the signs of forgetting? Three things. The first is neglecting the past. Moses writes, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. 
So it's important to look back as the past gives meaning to Israel's present relationship with God. To forget their past, uh, to get, forget their past experiences of God is to forget God himself. They cannot forget where they came from. They cannot forget the encounters and experiences they had with God in Egypt and in the wilderness wandering. They cannot forget all that God did for them and provided for them. They cannot forget all that God taught them. To do so is to forget God. Secondly, a proud heart. Moses says, uh, starting in verse I'll start in verse 11. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, laws, and His decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build, find houses and settle down, and when your, uh, your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So as the Israelites enjoy the, the wealth of the new land, it would be easy to remember how hard they fought for it, how much they deserved it after so many trials, and at the same time to forget that the land was a gift from God, that any military success they might have had was only because of God's presence and help. So wealth could very easily lead to pride, that is, to think that their wealth had been achieved as a result of their own human achievement. And to begin thinking like that is to begin forgetting God. And the third thing, thanklessness. Starting from verse 15. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So don't think that you did these things yourself. In other words, give proper acknowledgement to God. Know that God is the one who does it. And the implication of that, of giving acknowledgement to God, is thanksgiving. Now, if you look through the Psalms, the Psalms are full of thanksgiving that is given to God for his mighty deeds. In addition to, to the awe that we feel, a response to God's uh, might is thanksgiving. Now Paul writes about idolatry in, in Romans 1. And he, he, he suggests that one of the first signs that we are slipping into idolatry and forgetting God is when we stop giving thanks to God. So thanklessness is a sign of forgetting God. Do I remember that it's God who has blessed me with all that I have? Or have I fallen under the illusion that I, I gained all of this on my own? You know, it does feel good to know that you can afford things, that you can provide for your family, you can fill any need you have with some kind of material good. But have I let all the things I have and can enjoy around me destroy or at least severely weaken my love for, my desire for, and my dependence on God? Sometimes we're not aware of it. We find ourselves satisfied with what God gives us, that we, that we have no more want for God. Pastor John Piper, he put it very well here. He says, The greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. 
It is not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but endless nibbling at the table of the world. It is not the X-rated video, but the primetime dribble of triviality we drink in every night. For all the ill that Satan can do, when God describes what keeps us from the banquet, uh, banquet table of his love, it is a piece of land, a yoke of oxen, and a wife. The greatest adversary of love to God is not his enemies, but his gifts. And the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. So how do we not forget? How do we prevent this spiritual amnesia? Let me suggest three things to get us started. The first is to practice remembering. Now what do I mean by this? Do I mean you learn memorizing techniques? If you look at what Moses says to the Israelites, they are not to forget the Lord who brought them out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This was liberation at the Lord's hand. So what you have, uh, what have you experienced from God in your life? And how can you remind yourself regularly? Practically speaking, there are many things we can do. Some people have journals of their experiences with God. They would write down what they've learned or what prayers were answered, how God helped them. And perhaps every so often to review what they've, they've written. I used to know someone who would often add to a scrapbook their significant moments with God, things that would remind them of what they experienced with God. Um, you could even have a memory jar where you would write down your experiences on a small piece of paper and fold it up and put it into the jar. And then at the end of the year, you would review it and be reminded of all the things that you've experienced with God over the past year. So the thing is to be intentional in remembering. Learn to... Um, Learn to have a habit of remembering. The second suggestion is to learn humility. Moses reminds uh, the Israelites that some of their experiences in the wilderness was God's way of humbling them. They needed to see who was, who was really in charge, who was really in control, and to recognize their own frailty and dependence on God. The humbling of the Israelites was from their journey with God. And often that journey was full of difficult and uncomfortable experiences. And in those experiences, the Israelites could respond in two ways. They could complain and kick up a fuss and insist on God doing things their way. Or they could bow down and trust God's plan and timing and way. What is our attitude when things get challenging or, or uncomfortable? Do we want to say to God, God, I'm insulted. This shouldn't be happening to me. Fix it. Or do we seek to, to buy or negotiate our way out? Are we too proud to admit our mistakes and ask for help? Or do we recognize God's hand leading and shaping and forming our character? Do we desire to learn from God in the circumstances do we say, God, help me to trust you. Do what you think is best to teach me to rely on you more. Learn humility. And thirdly, give thanks to God. So if, as Paul says, an absence of thanksgiving is a sign of idolatry, then the solution to that is to give thanks. Thanksgiving is interesting in that it does two things. 
It reveals the well-being of our soul. Are we moving toward idolatry or, or toward God? And thanksgiving can control the state of our soul. So in times we don't feel far from God, or when we look around and realize that we've surrounded ourselves with idols, we give thanks to God to move ourselves away from idols and toward God. So something you can do, and I've, I've done this before, try this out. For the next seven days, every day in the morning, write down or, or type on your, on your computer or phone so you have a record. Don't just think about them. But record ten things that you're thankful for. Now feel free to repeat some things, you know, it doesn't all, doesn't all have to be deep. But try to think of, try to write down ten things that you're thankful for. And, you know, if you really can't think of anything significant, you can think of just simple things. God, I thank you that my toast didn't get burnt this morning. Give thanks for anything and everything you can think of, past, present, future. Develop, practice an attitude of gratitude for the God who loves you and saves you. And see how much more God is brought to your mind. In your comforts you enjoy, in your increase of wealth, in the blessings you receive from God. Do not forget God. Remind yourself. Be humble. And give thanks. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you for each and every blessing that you've given to us. God, I ask that you would forgive us for any times that we have forgotten you, that we have focused more on, on the gift rather than you, the giver. I pray, Father, that if there are any idols that are creeping up into our hearts, God, that you would expose those things. That you would help us, God, to take down those idols and to restore you in your rightful place in our lives. Help us not to forget you. Help us to keep you first in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.